Good morning, church. Good morning. And all of you at home, we say good morning to you. My name is Robin Burns, and I will be your worship leader this morning. Welcome to Women's Ministries Thank Offering Sunday. Our theme for this morning is Best Good News Ever. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is, the, he is Christ the Lord, from Luke 2, 10 and 11. Okay, kids, I would like you to, if you have a mask, put your mask on if you don't have it on, and I would like you to come up here on the stage and sit down here. Um, the three brothers, you can cluster up together. Um, Cole, you can stay a little bit away from them. Uh, Autumn, too, just spread yourselves out here. You can sit on the steps, it's easier. But you can sit down here. Yeah. You can take your masks off once you're seen. Why you sit down here? We love to have you in our service at least part. Oops, I forgot. Guys, I'm supposed to. Uh, I'm supposed to be using this for our people at home. Sorry about that, people at home. We like to have you, um, boys and girls, with us for at least a little while when we do um, Women's Ministry Sunday. Some of you have, some of you have um, barrels at home that you keep and sometimes you have put something in them so we always like you to be here with us. I have a question. <coughs> have your parents ever said, I have good news for you? What did they say? Can you think of any of the good news? It's Halloween. Oh, they have good news for you. It's Halloween. What about you, Alexander? Easter. Oh, they have good news for you. It's Easter. Anybody else? Do your parents ever say, I have good news for you? Well, they have, okay? I remember when I was about your age, and believe it or not, once upon a million years ago, I was. My dad said to me, I have good news. And I'm like, I was about nine, believe it or not. And your, your grandma Holly was a baby, a baby baby. And um, he said, we're going to the beach for two days. Now that was good news, wasn't that? But, you know, I have the best good news ever. Here it, here it is. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. Now, you heard that verse earlier today because I read it at the beginning of the service. You've heard that verse before. But the rest of the best news ever, listen to this. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life, John 3, 16. Guys, the best good news ever is that God loves us so much that he sent a baby. That baby was who? Jesus. Jesus. Jesus grew up. He taught the people, his disciples, the crowds. He loved the people, and he died on the cross for us. The best good news ever is that God loves 
us. He loves you, he loves you, he loves everybody out there, he loves me. That's the best good news ever. I have a heart sticker for you that I'm gonna put on you after we have prayer to remind us that, what do you think it's to remind us of? Alexander? God loves us. God loves us, yes. The best good news ever. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for these children. We ask that you bless them. We ask that they remember that you love them. You love them every day, all day long, every week, every year, that you love them. So Lord, be with them. Go with them as they um, go to school, as they work at home. Um, bless them all. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Good morning. God is good. All, all the time. time. All the time. God, God is good. good. Let's never, ever, 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 ever forget that. Um, the collection of thank offering monies this year is going to be significantly different, obviously, since it is being poured into the containers outside in the narthex. Um, that doesn't take away the importance of thank offering. I was a little chagrined to see on the new bank offering barrels the quote that was established by Grace Pearson is no longer on the bank offering barrel. I was about to tell you that everything you need to know about bank offering is right on the barrel because it always has been up until about 2017 when I guess I didn't notice it. <laughs> but in the past year, <clears throat> and a little more, since it's been a little more than a year since we collected our last thank offering girls, we've all had a number of things that we've been grateful for. Big things, like being able to welcome our new pastor in a couple of weeks. Little things, like we had a tad of rain yesterday. That makes some of us happy and it makes some of us not so happy since I had put down my weed and feed not thinking it was to rain yesterday. Um, that's kind of the benefit or the, the purpose of the thank offering barrel. Back in 1953, now I was only five, so a lot of you weren't even there, but Grace Pearson said, thank offering is a daily act of worship motivated by a sense of gratitude to God and expressed by our stewardship through prayer and gifts. Emphasizing prayer and gifts. And when you do that, thanking God verbally, putting a little token of something in the barrel to say, I really appreciate that you've done that. Or I really appreciate whatever it happens to be. And sometimes it's the appreciation of going through tough times, Sometimes it's the appreciation of something really big and you're really grateful for it. Um, on the barrel still tells you exactly where every penny goes. 100% of the monies that we donate go to ministries that are an outreach from uh, the churches of God. So when you put your thank offering into that barrel and when it gets back to the central area, it will be used for something of positive, not for all other kinds of things. So, let's see. If you need one of these, those of you outside and those of you here, they're in the narthex, a bunch of them. Please pick one up if you don't already have one. Um, if you forgot to bring your money today or last week, those little buckets will be available, I think, for you to bring those in. Two weeks. For the next two weeks, you can bring your little thank offering in and put that in. Now, Linda usually works Monday through Thursday, um, certainly from 8 o'clock and most usually between 12 and 1. It depends on her day. But she's here in the mornings, Monday through Thursday. Don't hesitate to bring those in or to come and pick your barrel up. So, daily worship to God through our prayers and our gifts. That's thank offering. Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you for the many coins and dollars that have already been placed in the uh, containers out in the narthex. Uh, we, ask, we offer up a prayer of thanks and gratitude for the fact that you are there for us, for us every day, through every moment of our lives. And as Robin said earlier, God loves us. Jesus loves us. And we need to turn to him with our troubles, and we need to turn with him to him. Uh, for our gratitudes for the life that he has provided for us. We ask in your name that you bless these offerings and put them to good use. For it is in your name we pray. Amen. The words of Paul from 1 Timothy 1, 12 through 17. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has given me strength that he considered me faithful appointing me to his service. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience as an example for those who would, who would believe on him and receive eternal life. Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. So how many of you watch the news regularly? Have you heard anything good recently? I stopped watching the news years ago. Now I read the news, but watching the news would just, I could just feel my blood pressure go up usually. So I thought, I'll read it. Then I can pick and choose what, I, what I'm aware of and how it enters into my mind and all sorts of things like that. Today's sermon is titled, The Best Good News Ever. And I think if you want to hear good news, it's not normally going to come off of ABC or CNN or MSNBC or Fox or whoever you listen to. In fact, I've been sort of upset lately about what I've been reading in the news too. So reading doesn't always uh, save you from the bad news. But whether it's the coronavirus or the racial issues that are going on in our, our society or the political wrangling, I will be glad when the election is over, won't you all? I, even, I, I, at this point, I'm not sure I care too much who wins. I just want it to be done. There's a lot of angst in our society right now. So I think it's appropriate for us today to just step back and focus on the great, the best good news that's out there and that has been out there for centuries. I think we need to recognize that our true identity doesn't lie in our race, our gender, our political party, our socioeconomic uh, standing, our employment, our education, uh, uh, anything. But as Christians, our identity is found in Christ. As we are saved sinners, and so our response should be like Paul's in, in verse 12 that Julie read. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord. You know, Paul wrote a lot of the New Testament. He wrote all these letters 
to churches that were in existence. He wrote to the Roman, church, the Roman church. He wrote to the Corinthians, to the Galatians, the Ephesians, the Philippians, the Thessalonians. And as you go through your Bible, all of a sudden then, you come to these couple letters that aren't written to churches, but they're written to individuals. And that's what Timothy, what First and Second Timothy are, they're part of what are called pastoral letters. Paul is writing to Timothy. Timothy was in one place, he calls him my son in the faith. He was a young man that Paul mentored to be pastor and he left him with the Ephesian church to oversee the work there. Now the Ephesian church was really probably pretty special to Paul. He had established the church there and he had had it as his center of um, ministry for over two years. He used it as the uh, sort of a base of operation as he went out on some of his mission trips to um, establish other churches in Asia Minor. That would be where Turkey is today. That's really where Ephesus is too. Um, and so the Ephesian church was really near and dear to Paul's heart. And while he's out doing some of his work in other places, he must have caught wind of the fact that the Ephesian church was being infiltrated by people giving false teachings. And if you look at the beginning of this chapter, he, he's telling Timothy, now I put you there so that you can keep that church in line and get good doctrine and stuff. And I've been hearing that there are certain people who are teaching false doctrine, they're devoting themselves to myths and genealogies, and those kinds of things are going to tear this church apart, is basically what he's saying. Some of them have even departed from the good, pure doctrine and uh, good conscience and sincere faith, and they've turned to meaningless talk. They want to be teachers of the law, and they don't even know what they're talking about. We know that the law is good, and we also know that the law is made not for the righteous, but for lawbreakers and rebels, the ungodly and sinful, the unholy and irreligious, and those who kill their fathers or mothers, for murderers, for the sexually immoral, for those practicing homosexuality, for slave traders and liars and perjurers. <gasps> and Paul takes a breath and says, and uh, if I've forgotten anything else, for whatever else is contrary to the sound doctrine that conforms to the gospel concerning the glory of the blessed God which he entrusted to me. I can just feel Paul's anger rising. His blood pressure is going up as he thinks of all the work he had done in the Ephesian church and how they are in danger of being pulled away from sound doctrine being pulled away back into the sin that, that so easily besets all of us, doesn't it? But all of a sudden, he's reminded that he has been called to preach the gospel, the good news concerning the blessed God. And so he pauses for about six verses and focuses his mind again on that calling that he received and who he is in Christ. And so that's the scripture we want to look at today. And he begins by saying, I thank, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord. You know, sometimes I think we call Jesus, Jesus Christ or Christ Jesus and it's sort of like his first and last name. You know, like I'm Linda Rosenberry or or, you know, Pat Berkheimer or whatever. Uh, no. Jesus is his human name. Jesus is the name that the angel Gabriel told Joseph that he should call this son that Mary was going to have. You will call his name Jesus. And you know what Jesus means? It means 
the Lord saves. It's the same, it's the Greek word, Greek name, that the Hebrew name Joshua is the same word. So Jesus or Joshua, the Lord saves. That's his human name. But Christ is the Greek word, same as Messiah in Hebrew, which means the Lord's anointed one. He came with a special mission and ministry to do what God had sent him into the world to do, to save humanity from ourselves and from Satan and from sin. So when we say Christ Jesus, we are really saying this is God's anointed one come in human flesh to save us from our sins. And then he adds the phrase, our Lord. Not only was Jesus appointed by God, came as a human being, but he is God himself. So Paul is basking in this thought, this very best good news ever, that God loved us so much that he sent his only son in human form to save us. And not only to save us, but Paul says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord because he's done all kinds of stuff for me, not just saved me. And he gives a list. Paul has been given strength. He's been considered trustworthy. He's been appointed to God's service. He's been shown mercy. He's received abundant, abundant grace faith, and love. You know, when I think about the Apostle Paul, when you read about him in Acts, all the stuff that he suffered for the gospel, the persecution, the imprisonment, he was targeted to be killed, he was shipwrecked, he was beaten, he was the focus of riots. If you read in 2 Corinthians 6, 4 through, I can't read my, my 4 through 10 I think it is. Anyway, um, he lists some of the persecution, some of the hardships that he faced. And yet in that passage, I just want to read a little bit of it to you because it's so neat. He lists all the hardships he's had and then he says, there have been bad reports and good reports, genuine but regarded as impostors, known yet regarded as unknown, dying, yet we live on, beaten, yet not killed, sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, poor, yet making many rich, having nothing, and yet possessing everything. What a great way for Paul to recognize that even though he was persecuted, God was with him through every situation, giving him what he needed to live a victorious life. In your own life, have you experienced, maybe not persecution to the extent Paul has, but maybe in your job, are there people who ridicule you for your Christian faith? Or maybe you have experienced some real physical hardship. We know that Paul had something going on physically because he says in one place that he's prayed and prayed that God would take this from him and he hasn't. So maybe you've experienced some physical problem, some burden that just seems like it's pulling you down. We need to recognize, like Paul did, that God can give us strength no matter what life throws at us. Even when you think you can't go on, God is there. God is there. And that's something to be so... That's the best... That's part of this best good news ever. We're not alone. God is with us. And then Paul, this... Jesus considered him trustworthy. You know, when I think about it, who are we really? Just a bunch of men and women, boys and girls, people who just live ordinary lives, and yet we know that God has given to us the responsibility 
of showing the world who he is, of reflecting his love to those around us, of being his ambassadors. Man, who am I that God should consider me worthy? And yet, just like Paul, he has appointed me to his service. How amazing. That's really great news. That's really great news. And then Paul goes on and says that he showed me mercy. And he poured out his grace abundantly. I'm sure you know about mercy and grace. They're not the same thing, really. Mercy, we all deserve justice. And if we were all held accountable for how we live our lives, none of us would be saved. But instead, God gives us mercy. He gives us what we don't... It, it, mercy is getting what we don't deserve. Or is not getting what we do deserve. That's mercy. Getting, not getting what we deserve. And grace is getting what we don't deserve. We don't deserve his love. We don't deserve his blessings. We don't deserve his love. But he chooses to bless us. He chooses to love us. He chose to die for our sins. That's the best good news ever. And along with that grace, Paul received faith and love in spite of who he was. And Paul refers to that, who he was. He says, I was once a blasphemer of Jesus. He ridiculed Jesus. He tried to persecute all those who were followers of him. You can read in the book of Acts how he got uh, permission from the Jewish council the Sanhedrin to go out and hunt down anybody who was a follower of Jesus and drag them back to Jerusalem so that they could be killed. He truly was a violent man. But God showed him mercy. God showed him mercy because he didn't know any better. And you know, today in this world there are a lot of people who just don't know any better. And yet God loves them and wants them to know him as their Lord and Savior. God's mercy and grace can reach even the most hardened criminal. Isn't that good news? I don't know who you have in your life that you're praying for. Maybe a family member, maybe a neighbor, maybe a co-worker, someone you just sometimes you think, oh Lord, I, I don't know if, if you really can reach this person. I think you can be encouraged by this message that Paul is giving right here, that even though he was looking to kill people, God in his mercy reached out and saved Paul, saved him from himself, saved him from his sin, and can use even the worst of sinners. Paul says, I'm the worst of sinners. I was the worst of sinners. And it, in verse 15, actually, he says, I am the worst. He been, not only was he the worst when he was doing all that terrible stuff, but he recognizes that in himself, apart from the forgiveness and grace of God, he is still the worst of sinners. In one place, Paul says, you know, I know what I should be doing, but it just seems like I try and I just, I, the things I should do, I don't, and the things I don't do, that's what I find myself doing. Oh, I am the worst. Can't we all relate to that? Outside of God's forgiveness and love, we continue to be the worst of sinners. But Paul is so thankful that God extended his mercy and his grace, and he continues to extend his mercy and his grace to Paul, to all of us. 
we can trust. That's a trustworthy saying. I like how Paul says that. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save all of us because all of us are sinners. Thanks be to God. So what's our response? What's our response when we have received this great salvation? It's easy to bask in our salvation and forget that it comes with responsibility. Paul says, but for this very reason, the, re the fact that Jesus came and saved me out of my sin, for this very reason I was shown mercy so that in me, in me, his immense patience might be shown as an example to those who would believe in him. Is your life an example of what Christ has done for you? That's a real responsibility that comes with, with our salvation. God said, or Paul says, God showed me mercy and displayed his immense patience. Oh my, I'm glad God is patient with me. You know, when I lose my temper, when I just fritter away my time on something that is of no eternal consequence at all, God loves me enough that he doesn't strike me down. He says, Linda, you know better. You know better. And he pulls me back to himself. God is patient with us so that we can be an example to others of how God can change a life. Is your life an example of God's mercy, of God's grace, of God's patience? You know, the passage that Julie read ends with this wonderful verse. It's almost like a benediction. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. How does God receive honor and glory through us? I pray that he does. I pray that he is pleased when he looks at Linda Rosenberry. I know there are times that I so disappoint him. There are lots of times like that. But aren't we thankful? Isn't it the best good news ever that when he looks at us, he sees us through the blood of Jesus Christ. And our sins are forgiven. Our past sins, our present sins, and our future sins. That's the best good news ever. So Paul goes on in this chapter to talk to Timothy, my son. He says, I am giving you this command, the command to be faithful to God, in keeping with the prophecies once made about you, so that by recalling them, by recalling that you have a calling on your life, you may fight the battle well, holding on to faith and a good conscience. Paul's writing to encourage Timothy, and I am so glad we have this letter that can also encourage us. What is the call on your life? You know, in Ephesians chapter 4, Paul gives that great um, passage where he talks about how God calls each of us to serve him, that God gives us various gifts and talents to fulfill that calling. Are we living up to the calling God has put on our life? Are we fighting the battle against Satan well? Today, like I said, you turn on the TV and whether you listen to the news or watch a show that has real questionable moral behavior in it or whatever, I mean, we are inundated with the message of Satan. Hatred is alive and well in this world. Fear is alive and well in this world. 
Are we fighting the battle against Satan well? Because we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Remember when you're upset at somebody or you hear something or see something that just starts making your blood boil. Where does this fit into the battle between Satan and God? How can you stay true to what God has called you, to the truth that you know is God's truth? Are you holding on to your faith? It's so easy to be swayed in this culture. It really is. But Paul encourages Timothy, hold on to your faith. Hold on to a good conscience. How do you get a good conscience? You stay prayed up when you know you did something you shouldn't have. You take that sin to the Lord and you say, Oh Lord, I messed up again. I'm just like Paul. I do the stuff I know I shouldn't and I don't do the stuff I know I should. But please, Lord, forgive me. And you know he will. He will. And all of that, fighting the battle against sin, holding on to your faith, keeping your conscience clear. That's how we glorify God in our life, through our speech, through our thoughts, through our actions. It truly is a trustworthy saying. Jesus came to save sinners, all of us, from ourselves and from Satan, so that we can display his grace through how we live our lives. Isn't that the best good news ever? Let's, let's pray. Lord, you know that we are just sinners, and it is so easy to stray from what you have called us to do, what you have called us to be. But thanks be to God, Lord, thank you, that you love us anyway, that you forgive us, our sins, and that you supply what we need to live victoriously. Lord, just help us to rely on you. And we pray this now in Christ's holy, blessed name. Amen. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen and amen.